So it's fascinating that almost any human characteristic you can think of, and that's from diseases all the way through to behaviours, shows some genetic influence. So today I'm going to talk about two projects in my lab that use the techniques of computational social science to try to understand how genes and environment interact in human behaviour. So here's my universe. We have the genotype, the genetic variants. We have the phenotype, so that's the disease outcome or the human behaviour. Uh, but this relationship between genotype and phenotype, genetic variation and the outcome, takes place in context. And it takes place in the context of physical environments. It also takes place in a context of psychosocial environments, which I'll touch on later. And it takes place um, across time, across development. So how do we know this? One way we can get at both genetic and environmental influences before we've done any genotyping, before we've gone in and looked at individual genetic variants at all, is using twins. But still, to do a twin study, you need thousands and thousands of twins. So I'm going to talk about data from the Twins Early Development Study. And that's um, 10,000 <coughs> pairs of twins who've been followed up from birth uh, to adulthood in the UK. And they've, over this time, they've completed <coughs> hundreds and hundreds of different measures. Um, and they now have um, genotype uh, data available from the Wellcome Trust as well. So if you've measured some characteristics of both twins, you can put it together into a structural equation model like this. And here we use what we know about the relationship between identical twins, that's monozygotic twins, and fraternal twins, that's dizygotic twins, to decompose the variants into additive genetic effects, shared environmental effects, and non-shared environmental effects, that's A, C, and E. And you might think that once you've calculated heritability for any particular trait, that's it, that's, um, that's all you get out of it, but that's not true. If you've measured the same characteristic at different times or different characteristics, you can start to look at the relationship between different, um, different measurements. So here we have um, IQ or cognitive ability tests measured at different ages from early childhood through to middle childhood. And here we've grouped them with latent variables in early and middle childhood. And we've decomposed the genetic and the, the phenotypic variants on these two latent factors into additive genetic, shared environmental, and non-shared environmental effects. And if we look at the change from early to middle childhood, we can see, surprisingly, in early childhood, genes account for around 20% of the variance between people, whereas in middle childhood, um, genetic factors account for around 60 or 70% of the variance. Now, that's counterintuitive. That's not what you'd expect. You'd expect as you get older, genetic influences have less effect, right? But here we see genetic influences actually increasing. And it's not just cognitive You also see it for obesity and body mass index. So you can see here at age four, um, heritability is relatively low. But up to age 10, 11, it goes up quite dramatically. And it's not just a thing about twins. If you look at the molecular level, if you pick out particular genetic variants that we know are reliably associated with these traits, you can see the effect size of these individual um, variations increasing alongside the heritability. So even though our DNA sequence doesn't change over time, the influence that that sequence might have on the phenotype does. So. My first question, I thought, well, if we can see these changes over time, can we see the same sort of change over space? Can we see whether the balance of nature and nurture varies depending on where we grow up? So to answer that, I modified the standard twin model um, to incorporate spatial information. So here's the model we saw earlier. Um, but now <coughs> we're weighting the contribution of the individual twins um, by the distance from the point of estimation. So if I'm trying to estimate genetic and environmental effects here, then these guys will contribute the most, these guys will contribute the least. And if you repeat that for thousands of locations across the UK, 
you can build up a map of the areas where genetic influences are more important and the areas where environmental influences are more important. So in this map, we can see we're looking at genetic influences. We can see uh, red is high. We can see a genetic hotspot in London uh, for this particular trait and less genetic influence in the north of England. And this is the space tool I built to explore the data. So here we have a big panning and zooming main map. Here's the overview in the top right hand corner. There's a histogram of all the um, distribution of data points across the whole map. And then there's the big list of the different phenotypes we've looked at using this. Of course, tools like this can be fantastic for bringing together people from different disciplines in a joint understanding of the data. But when you're building something like this, you have to take into account idiosyncrasies of the human visual system. I mean, our eyes weren't, uh, they didn't evolve to understand statistical graphics, surprisingly. Um, so you have to fight against things like this. In this uh, diagram, the squares A and B actually are the shame, same shade of grey. Now, they don't look like it, but I can prove it to you with these bars laid over the top. And the amazing thing is, even when I know that they're the same shade of grey, when I take those bars away, they go back to looking black and white again. It's completely different. And you can't train yourself not to see this, so we need to take it into account when we're making data visualisations. So what sort of thing have we done to incorporate that? Well, on the left, we have um, the histogram, the distribution of values across the whole map, and you can see we've selected the extremes of distribution, the pieces of data we're really interested in to stand out most. We've made the extremes of distribution most psychologically salient, so you can see the hot spots and the cold spots. And then to give people, keep people grounded on where they are in the data, we've included this overview map, which always shows where you are, even when you're zoomed right in. And this is supported by a website, um, you can download the source code and all the data, um, open access article. And because people hate uh, reading instruction manuals, there's also a video that shows you how it all works. So what sort of things have we discovered using this technique? Well, this map is of environmental influences on uh, classroom behaviour problems ac across England and Wales. And you can see we have this hotspot in London of environmental influences on classroom behaviour problems. Now, by talking to a lot of subject matter experts, uh, we came up with the idea this might be explained by something like income inequality, which is distributed in a very similar way across the map. And when you have a particular environment, a particular candidate environment like this, you can follow it up with further structural equation models like this continuous moderator model, which allows the genetic and environmental components to vary as a function of um, the continuous moderating environment. And this is the sort of thing you get. So here you can see, as we move across local variance in household income, our measure of income inequality here, as we increase that, we can see how the proportions of genetic and environmental influence change. So we can see that the E component, the environmental, non-shared environmental component, increases greatly as you increase um, the local variance in household income. So these are some of the directions I'm going to take space over the next few years. Um, I'll highlight uh, just a few of them. So one question is, how do these maps change through development? We've taken a snapshot initially when the twins were 12 years old, um, but we have data from across 20 years, and it'll be fascinating to see how things change across time. How can we use this information to increase, increase our power to detect individual genetic variants in genome-wide association studies, that's GWAS studies? Of course, the... Um, the example I've shown you today is correlational. It's not necessarily causation. So how can we incorporate causal data into this um, to, to get at causal associations between um, the environment and genetic and environmental effects? 
And we're very lucky um, to have been invited to apply this method to lots of different data sets across the world. So it'll be fascinating to see how these hold up across different countries. My second example is the Embers stream of our research. That's environmental monitoring by electronic remote sensing. And the thinking behind this is that in human genetics, we now have vast amounts of genotype data. It's getting cheaper and cheaper all the time to um, get at people's genetic variation. Uh, recently, it was announced that we can sequence a human genome for less than $1,000. So what's actually the bottleneck now? What's restricting us? is our access to phenotypic data about these people. Quite often in a genetic study, we just have one measurement. We know whether someone has a disease or doesn't have a disease. But how can we get rich phenotypic data at the same resolution as we have our genetic data? And the first phase of this plan is to use Twitter data. Now, uh, this is part of an MRC Centenary Award um, we have Claire Howarth, who's at Warwick. She's just over there. Um, and we have um, uh, asked the TED Swins whether we can have access to their Twitter accounts. Uh, we did initial screening of 6,000 uh, members of TEDs. And it's fascinating that TEDs really is the internet generation. They're turning around 20 um, now. Almost all of them participate in social networking in the vast majority every day. And of course, they're at life stage, where it's, it's a critical stage for the development of psychiatric disorders. We won't understand this or future generations of adults unless we understand these social networks. So far, we've collected 3 million tweets from um, 2,400 twins. And this is very much a first look at the data. Um, this is coding positive and negative affect, and you can see that we're getting exactly what you'd expect, which is hugely reassuring. We get uh, the regular weekly cycle um, starting off low on a Monday and rising through the week. And we also get the positive events you'd expect, such as New Year's Day, Valentine's Day, Christmas Day, and surprisingly, A-level results day. Um, but we also get the negative events you'd expect. Um, the highest negative um, event from last year was a terrorist attack in southeast London. To zoom in just on one example, here's the positive emotion peak for A-level results day. Um, perhaps surprising, but I guess people who didn't get the results they, weren't, uh, <laughs> didn't, they wanted weren't tweeting about it. But if we look at the anxiety trace, we can see that the most anxious point of the whole year was the day before A-level results day. So it looks like what we really have is this vast database of real-time ecologically valid information that we can then use to understand the genetic and environmental influences on um, mood across emerging adulthood. So there's a lot of work to do now. Um, I'm just going to highlight a few things. So the first thing to do is to validate the data and also to compare it with 20 years of data that we already have in the Twins Early Event Study. Uh, the second is to develop large-scale longitudinal twin models that can handle um, 3 million tweets and more. It's all coming in all the time. And also how we can incorporate particular measured genetic variants that we know about into this type of genetic model through polygenic risk scores. Thank you very much. <laughs>